Hey guys, this is Mr. Mitchell. Today we're going to be talking about selective absorption and selective reflection. So just to recap, uh, the energy on waves really quickly, we know that the main purpose of waves is that they transfer energy from one place to another place. And we know that that energy that the wave carries depends upon the wave's amplitude and the wave's frequency. So we're going to hone in on this frequency idea a little bit more today. Um, we then talked about the natural frequency. So we said that every object, every material has this thing called a natural frequency of vibration. Um, and that is the frequency that the particles in that material tend to vibrate at. Right? And so the natural frequency can only be changed if I change the object or change the system itself. So uh, the example we did in class was we had the ball attached to a slinky and we we're able to kind of change the amplitude of it but the frequency stayed the same so how did I change the natural frequency of that well I took the slinky and I made the slinky a little bit longer so now I've changed the system itself that's the only way I can change the natural frequency the natural frequency is actually what determines how that wave is going to transfer energy to other objects all right or um, how a object might receive energy that is coming into it so let's look at that uh, a little bit more closely. We have an example here where you're pushing maybe a, a child on a swing. All right, and so the child is swinging back and forth, and you're going to push them to give them more energy to get them to go higher on the swing. You're not going to wait till they come down into the middle and then push them right there. They're going to fly off the swing. You're going to hurt them. All right, so what do you do? You wait till the swing comes all the way back up to the top, and then you give it some more energy there, and that's what drives it forward. And so the natural frequency of the swing is what you're working with. It naturally wants to go at this certain rate, and we put energy in at just the right time to keep that frequency going. So um, a larger scale example of this is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which in uh, the 40s, this, this was a, a huge disaster that happened because they didn't, uh, the engineers didn't account for the natural frequency of this bridge. So we're just going to look at a video of it really quickly. We'll just highlight a couple of the key points here. So um, there's a, a wind going through, and so the bridge, as the wind is traveling, just starts to shake, and you see that it's got this consistent frequency to it. The, the distance between these two beams uh, is about a half of a wavelength, and so um, it's, it's continuing to vibrate back and forth. We'll kind of fast forward here a moment up to about the 145 mark. And this is just zooming in on kind of a, a more up close and personal view of it on the bridge itself. You see that it's just rocking back and forth and back and forth. It's vibrating at this natural frequency. All right. And so we'll fast forward again to about 245 here. Again, it just gets a little bit closer. So you see the car was actually stranded on the bridge. They were driving on the bridge. They came, came across this crazy shakiness. And so they decided, you know, we're just going to leave our car and get out of here. Um, and eventually, we get to a point, right, about the 315 mark, where the bridge just can't take it anymore. It's consistently going back and forth, back and forth, and eventually it just falls apart. All right, so this has some pretty dramatic results um, and applications to real life, right? Engineers have to account for this kind of stuff all the time when they're designing bridges, when they're designing buildings, because... You know, uh, you know, a bridge has, has wind that might be pushing that, but a building maybe has an earthquake that comes through it. And so if that earthquake's frequency matches the natural frequency of the building, you could be in big trouble. So that is selective absorption, right? You're pushing a child on a swing. You have this bridge that collapses. Um, and what's happening uh, at the, the small scale level is that the incoming wave, the energy that's coming in, either from me pushing the child on the swing or from the wind driving the bridge, is matching the natural frequency of the material. So when I'm pushing the child on the swing, I'm matching the frequency of the swing. When the wind's coming in and causing the bridge to oscillate like that, it's matching the natural frequency of the bridge. And when that happens, those objects want to absorb that energy to kind of drive that motion and keep it moving. So the kid on the swing is going back and forth, and they're going higher and higher. The bridge is oscillating back and forth and back and forth until eventually it just can't take it anymore. So let's look at a counterexample. All right, so we, we talked about the selective absorption of energy. What happens when 
there's energy that's reflected from a laser. We saw this in our examples in class with the laser beam. There's obviously some kind of reflection going on there. How does that happen? So you can think about really just any colors that we perceive with our eyes. Um, what happens is light is uh, that we see is white light, and that's a combination of all the different colors in the spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Okay, so they're all coming in through this white light. When I see a red shirt, all right, what's happening is the shirt, you can think of it two ways. The shirt is absorbing every single color, all the frequencies of those colors except for red, or you can think of it as the shirt is reflecting that red color back out. And so what we are perceiving is just a reflection of white light where part of the light gets absorbed, but some of it is then reflected back out. And so a red shirt has absorbed everything but red, and red is reflected back. All right. Um, a green shirt, same deal. All It's absorbing everything but green, and then green is reflected back. So the color we perceive is an example of this idea of selective reflection. Instead of absorbing, we're now reflecting a color back. So when the frequency of the incident wave, the one that's coming in, is not the same as the natural frequency of the material, then part of that energy is reflected back because the, the material is not ready to absorb it. It's like pushing the kid on the swing when they get into the middle. That's not a good time to push the child, right? It doesn't, at that point, the swing doesn't want to accept any more energy. You're just going to reflect that, that energy out, okay? So that's about all we have to say about absorption and reflection. We're going to get into a lab um, in the coming days where you're going to actually look at some materials and different electromagnetic waves to see maybe what, what is it that causes things to absorb or what causes things to, to reflect. So uh, hopefully this is helpful at least as an introduction, and then we'll get into kind of the, the applications of it with more physical hands-on things as we continue here.